the lesson here this morning. It's going to be on and examining the teachings of Christ. We're going to not be examining all the teachings of Christ. It'll be a long sermon. But we're going to look at a couple things here this morning because there's something that I want us to notice that, uh, that is something I read some articles on this week, and, and it's called the paradox of Jesus, right? And we're going to look at some uh, what a paradox is. We're going to look at some of his teachings, and we're going to ask ourselves, are some of the things that Jesus teach as we read some places, are they contradictory or are there, are there no contradictions there? And so we're going to look to answer that question here this morning. Uh, Miles read Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13 here this morning, 13 through 16. And when you read that section of scripture, Jesus asks his disciples, who, does, who do men say that I am? And some of them said, well, they say John the Baptist or they say Elijah or, or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And it's really, when I read scripture, and I'm sure many others have really thought this, it's kind of interesting, if not puzzling, um, that the people didn't really fully understand uh, and recognize who Jesus was, kind of like what Gina was saying in Bible study this morning, you know. <coughs> How did they not recognize him? How did they not fully understand it? And sometimes I think we need to give them a little grace, because we have the complete, full, uh, the complete uh, revelation of God laid out before us. Well, as they were going through this, I mean, you think about Jesus' disciples, they're seeing and hearing all this for the first time, right? And they're trying to wrap their heads around it. They're trying to make sense of it. And remember, Jesus' disciples, they weren't the educated of the day. They were blue-collar fishermen, right? And so, yeah, sure, they, had, uh, they, they knew the law, but they didn't know it like, the, say, the, the rabbis would have known the law or the teachers of the law or the scribes. But they knew the law. And so when we look at you know, the, these, these questions here this morning about uh, Jesus' teachings and as we examine some of his teachings, I want us to think about it from the idea that part of, uh, part of that is Jesus presents a great scriptural paradox. And, and, and just to give you an example of some of those things is, it, you know, Scripture tells us that Jesus didn't come to save, uh, or Jesus uh, didn't come to judge, but he came to save. But then you read other passages of Scripture, and Jesus is our judge. And then you see some passages that say Jesus didn't come to cause division, but he came to bring peace. Well, was, but then you read other passages of Scripture, and while he's called the Prince of Peace, he also brought the sword. And so well, which one is it? And so are there contradictions there? And to understand what a paradox is, really a paradox is something that may seem contradictory on the surface, but, be, uh, but after further uh, study, after further understanding, you realize that there is no contradiction. There is a resolution in there. I mean, you think about the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ could be one of those things that can be considered a paradox, right? We know that it says that he won, but he won by surrendering. You know, he li you know we live while he dies. You know, and you, you think about those paradoxes. And in this lesson, I want us to, to look and examine a couple of those paradoxical statements. Like I said a minute ago, um, Jesus didn't come to judge but to save. Uh, Jesus didn't come to cause, the, uh, to cause division, but he came to bring peace. And so to understand these passages of Scripture, we do what we always say that we do here in the church. And that we don't look to any one passage of Scripture or two passages of Scripture. We look to the, the, to the Scriptures as a whole to see what is the full understanding of what Jesus has to say on any given topic. And so let's get started with the very first one. In John chapter 3, verse 17, is where we see that first statement that Jesus didn't come to judge, but he came to save the world. And that what he says there in John 3 and 17 also matches up with what we see in John 12 and 47. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, Jesus says, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but I came to save the world. And you say, okay, well, that makes sense. That kind of matches up with what we see in John 3, 17. But you look at another passage of Scripture in, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 36. And it says, for the Son of Man did not come to do what? To destroy lives, but to save lives. And so how many times have you been out in public and, or you go to like a Christian bookstore or, um, and you see things like, uh, we see uh, church signs, for example. You drive down the road, and you'll see a church sign that says, Jesus saves. Every time I go down Gibraltar Road, there's a, there's a church that says, Jesus saves on it, right? And I say, amen, Jesus does save. We see bumper stickers that say, Jesus saves. We see t-shirts that, that say, Jesus saves. And while that is true, that's only half the story. If you stopped reading right there, then you'd be able to say, yeah, Jesus saves. But is that the full story? 
Or is there a contradiction when we go on to see that there's passages of Scripture that often talk about how Jesus has come to judge, and Jesus will be our judge? Well, did he, is he come to save us, or did he come to judge us? Which one is it? Is there a contradiction there? And no, and that's what the Bible calls a paradox, right? And so as we look into the Scriptures here this morning, uh, I want us to really uh, think about and recognize uh, that Jesus, as we all know, is our Lord and Savior. However, there are those who will abuse various passages of Scripture by saying that all will be saved. There's various denominations who will look to uh, uh, John 3.16, who will look to John 3.17, who will look to uh, John chapter 12 and Luke chapter 9, and they'll say, say, Jesus is going to save. He came to save us, not to condemn us. But, brother, there are those who will take these messages or take these passages out of context as to what the Bible says on the whole of the subject. And when I look at what the Bible says on the whole of the subject, we could see what this, uh, we could see that there's some paradoxes here. And so for one instance, how people will take this out of context is, there's a, there's a, a book called Love Wins. I don't know if you guys have heard of this book, but have you guys heard of the pastor, preacher, called, uh, pastor, preacher, author called Rob Bell? Rob Bell's really sold, you know, uh, millions of books, right? He sold books all around, the, all around the country, all around the world. People have bought his books. He's actually a, a preacher, I believe, somewhere on the, on the west side of the state in one of those bigger uh, 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 congregations. And when you read his book, In Love Wins, he says, the gospel is exclusive, but it's also inclusive, and in that people worldwide will be saved even if they do not profess Christ. This is a Christian pastor and author named Rob Bell in, in this book, Love Wins. He also goes on to say that uh, Bell affirms that heaven... Um, it says that the scripture sometimes defines that as the present day. And he also uh, affirms that he believes in hell. But he says also in the book that, that that is sometimes not a literal place, but it's a synonym for the suffering that modern people are going to deal with here on this earth. And so this is a, a Christian pastor. He's, a, he's an author. And he's wrote, written books that have sold many, many copies. And Christians are buying these books, and they're reading things that, uh, like what Bell just affirmed here about heaven, what Bell affirmed here about hell. But brethren, individual views of heaven and hell are so very crucial to the, uh, to the worldwide outreach as well as impact on the gospel for the world. Because if you were to listen to what Bell has to say here, how he'll take so certain passages and, and take them out of context, and, and, and he doesn't harmonize them with the rest of the scriptures, we can very easily see that um, there's a problem here. If theological inclusivism or hypothetical universalism, as, the, as he talks about in the book, if, if that is true, well, then the motivation for missions just goes by the wayside. Why go on a mission? Why go all the way across the world to teach people about Jesus if everybody's going to be saved? They don't need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't need to hear the gospel if you don't need to hear the gospel to be saved. And so, brethren, that's just one example. But people like Rob Bell and others, they'll look at passages of Scripture like 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22, where it says, For as, Adam, uh, for as in Adam all die, also in Christ all will be made alive. Well, you can see how somebody like Bell and others will look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22. You can see how they'll say, yeah, see, see what it says right there? It tells us that for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Well, what is he talking about there? Well, to further understand that, you have to look at the context of the scripture. It, it, if you just read that passage, you might, you might come away believing with him. But that's if you only read that one passage. But what about the verse right before that? When you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 21, it says... For since by a man came death, by, uh, by a man will also come the resurrection of the dead. So to keep this in context, brother, we don't, uh, we don't draw a conclusion from any one passage without looking at the whole of Scripture on any one topic and making sure that things are being kept in context. And so he is not, when you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 21 and 22, the Apostle Paul, he's not talking about spiritual life and spiritual death. Paul is talking about uh, what happens because of Adam. What happens because of Adam in sin is that men die physically. We don't have access to the tree of life anymore, thus we die physically. And you understand that when you read what 1 Corinthians 15 is teaching us, that in Christ everyone is going to be raised up at the end of the day. Paul isn't talking about whether you're going to heaven or hell. 
Paul is simply just telling us that because of what Adam did, everybody's going to physically die. And because of what Christ did, everybody's going to be, uh, everybody's going to, going to be resurrected. But there are going to be those who are resurrected to blessings, and there are those who are going to be resurrected to condemnation. And so in verses 15, uh, 15, 21, and 22, he's not talking about heaven and hell. But we still have to face the judgment because we understand that when we look at the whole of Scripture, that the purpose of Jesus coming, he was, uh, was not to judge the world, but his main purpose for coming was to do what? To bring peace, to reconcile man unto God. And so that was the purpose, that was his main purpose for coming. But you can't stop reading there. You have to look at the rest of Scripture. For example, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30 and 31, we know that we see God, it tells us that he appoints Jesus as judge. In Acts 17, the Scriptures tell us, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere need to repent. Because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world with righteousness through a man, meaning Jesus, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men, by raising him from the dead. Brethren, you look at that passage, and you also look at other passages like Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31 through 46. We're not going to read that. But in Matthew chapter 25, in that passage of scripture, we see that Jesus is going to sit on the throne as a judge and divide the sheep from the goats. Amen? That's what we learn in Matthew chapter 25. And he's going to give eternal life, meaning eternal blessings, to some. But he's also going to give eternal life and condemnation to others. For all mankind is going to be resurrected, some to life, some to condemnation, some to blessings, some to, uh, to, to pain and suffering. And we also know in John chapter 5 and verse 22 and 23, we see that the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. So you look at these various passages of Scripture, and to understand them, we have to understand that it's a paradox. A paradox is something that, on the surface, originally, uh, it looks like it may be a contradiction. But beyond fur further understanding, we know that there's resolution there, and there is no contradiction at all. Brethren, the main purpose for Jesus Christ coming to this world is to, is to bring peace, is to reconcile man unto God. But if you do not stop, but if, if you do not respond to Jesus, if you reject Jesus, if you reject his sacrifice, if you reject what he's done for you, well then guess what? Judgment is going to come upon you. He came to bring peace. He came to give life. But if you reject what he gives, then condemnation is going to follow. And so when we stand before Jesus in the afterlife and the judgment, brethren, we're not going to be standing before a fleshly man. We're going to be standing before the Son. We're going to be standing before the Word. We're going to be standing before God in all of his glory. And so there is no contradiction when you understand the whole of Scripture. And we will be judged by the very words that Jesus spoke. But Jesus tells us in Scripture in John chapter 12, that the words that I speak, they're not mine. John 12, 46 through 50, it's something I talk about regularly because it's important to understand that Jesus says that the, what I, I do and I speak exactly as the Father has commanded me. And the Father, I speak exactly as he, as he has commanded me because his words contain eternal life. So Jesus says, I didn't come to judge the world, he tells us in John 12. He says, I did come to save the world. But if you reject me, if you reject my teachings... You have one that judges you. My words, which aren't mine, they're really the Father's. I am just relaying the message unto you, is what will judge you in the last day. Brethren, the thing about paradoxes is that while they may seem contradictory, they're not. Resolution and understanding exists if you're able to see the big picture. And so we, now we look at the very next one. The next one is Jesus didn't come to cause division, but to bring peace. Well, we understand that when we go all the way back to the book of Isaiah, you look at what the prophet Isaiah had to write in uh, Isaiah 9 and 6, and I don't have it on the screen behind me, but he tells us in Isaiah 9 and 6 that his name, talking about prophesying about Jesus, about the Christ, the Messiah, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And so the second paradox that we're going to look at is that Jesus didn't come to cause division, but he came to bring peace. He's going to be called the Prince of Peace. And so how could the Prince of Peace bring anything other than that? 
And so, brethren, when you look at Jesus and being that he's the Prince of Peace, we also know that Jesus loves the idea of unity, unity amongst the believers. In his high priestly prayer, uh, prayer in Acts chapter 17 and around verse 20 and 21, what was Jesus praying for on the night before his death? What was he praying for in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was praying that all men, all his disciples, would be united unto the Father, that we would be like as they are, as, 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 you are, as you are in me and I am in you, that all disciples will be one, and that mankind will believe that I have been sent from you. And so, brethren, you look at John 17 and Isaiah 9, and we know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We see that he's praying about unity. Well, what is unity? Unity implies peace. That you can have peace because we are unified in word. We are unified in deed. And so it implies peace. But don't stop reading there. Because if you stop reading there, you could actually come to the wrong idea of what Jesus is teaching in, his whole, in, the, in the collective word of God, in the collective revelation of God. For example, in Matthew chapter 34, if you look on the screen behind me in verse 30 through 37, Matthew 10, 34 through 37. Do not think that I came to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the Prince of Peace. I thought he came to bring peace. But now all of a sudden he brought a sword to the party. He says, for I came to set a man against a father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You look at what the scriptures are telling us here, brethren, and you have to ask yourself, well, which one is it? Is he the Prince of Peace? Or did he come to bring division? Is there, is, is there a contradiction here? Well, it's not a contradiction. It's also one of those paradoxes. A seemingly contradiction, but it can be resolved. Because in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34, Jesus was pointing out the distinguishing nature of truth. We know truth is also called what? The sword of the Spirit. And so we know that the sword can be used offensively as well as defensively. If you go back and you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and you, and you read about the, uh, putting on the full armor of God, they're all defensive except for one, the sword of the Spirit. And so brethren, Jesus is telling us the nature of truth, because the sword of the Spirit uh, is representative of the truth of God's Word. And so you look at this. The truth will cause family members to be divided. Why? Because it allows no compromise. Jesus' Word, God's Word, allows no compromise. You're either in or you're out. You either accept the plan A or you accept plan B. There is no plan C. You either accept Jesus or you reject Jesus. You're either on team Satan or you're on team God. And so you get to choose. And that's why God gives us free will choice. And so, brethren, the truth will cause family members to be divided amongst themselves because it allows no compromise. This indicates that the peace that Jesus provides, it's not human tranquility. It's not doctrinal compromise. The, 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 the peace that Jesus provides is first and foremost with the Father. The peace that Jesus came to provide is first and foremost with God. Jesus abolishes the guilt of sin that separates us from God. Remember what is said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13 and 14. Remember what Paul wrote to the people of Ephesus. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by what? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Well, you look at these words that Paul wrote. These words point to the kingship of Jesus. When Jesus' birth was announced, what did the angels proclaim? They proclaimed that the child that was born and the son that would be given would bring, would bring what? Peace on earth and goodwill towards men. So is there a contradiction? No, there's not a contradiction. Brethren, it's important that we remember that this is the peace that Jesus brings is with God. The peace that Jesus brings with God uh, is with God and his followers, but not the world. Jesus didn't come to bring peace to all the world. He came to bring peace to all those who will accept him as Lord and Savior. And he did not come to bring peace to all the world, and that may include some of our families. It may include some of our family members. And while Jesus did bring peace, 
it was not the only thing he was going to bring. And so this is where many people make their mistake. How many times do you hear people always talk about nowadays that God's a loving God, he's a peaceful God, he wants us to all be, to get along, he wants us to all be unified. And you hear people talk about, talk about that all the time. But they really never give you the other half of the story, right? They just say, surely, Grandpa God, right? They think of God as like this loving grandpa, right? Who's never going to uh, really uh, punish any of his grandchildren. Hey, boys will be boys, right? Girls will be uh, girls. We mess up. Uh, he loves us. Surely he's not going to punish us. Surely he's not going to condemn us to hell. Brethren, if you only read about the love and the peace and the mercy and the grace of God, you'll never fully understand the other half of the story. Jesus also brings division. And he also brought the idea of taking away peace, and that is where the idea of the sword comes in. The sword is the truth, and he puts the sword, the truth, into a man's hand, into a man's heart, into his mind. And the sword is a symbol of warfare. We are, we are not in a physical war, but we are absolutely in a spiritual war. So to the Christian, the, the, the sword is our spiritual weapon that we use to defeat the attacks of the evil one. It's the same sword that Jesus used when he attacked the, the uh, when he uh, when he defended himself against the attacks of the evil one, when he uh, defended the attacks of Satan in the wilderness. And so the sword represents the word of God. And it will not always bring peace. But brethren, in many instances, it's going to bring conflict. It's going to bring division. And that's what Jesus was telling us there in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34 through 37. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a, father, a, 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 a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Why? Why is that going to happen? Well... It's going to happen, brethren, because Jesus understood that there would be more people who reject his word, who reject him, who reject his sacrifice, than those who accept it. And so Jesus knew that all who rejected his word and his sacrifice were going to be in conflict with those who accepted it. Why do you think so many Jewish families were torn apart in the beginning of the church? Why do you think it talks about in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 that they had all things in common, the brethren, the, uh, the brothers and sisters in Christ, and they were selling things and sharing as anyone would have need? Why? Because Jewish family members were, were, were kicking out individuals of their family who accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's no different than in Muslim families. If you convert to Christianity from Muslim, good luck with that. Brethren, I've often said that if you're going to... Uh, to, to uh, if you're going to teach and if you're going to hold the Bible studies with a Muslim, that's fantastic. We should do those types of things or anybody else of a different religion. But be ready to give them a place to stay. Be ready to open up your home because they will be uh, <laughs> excommunicated from their family. They won't have, be able to, to have that same familial relationship that they had when they were a member of mom and dad's religion. And so it's not just the Jews. It's not just the Muslims. Christians do the same thing. There have been many Christians uh, growing up in the, in, the, in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s who, who put on Christ in baptism, who left Catholicism, who left the Baptist church, who left the Lutheran church. But those families who were all in, they would kick those family members out. And so Christians would turn their backs on other Christians. And so it's not just something that's uh, just something that only Muslim families have to deal with or Jewish families. Christian families have done the same thing. Brethren, we've all been guilty of it at one time or another. You know why? Because in the Bible, Christianity it tells us that there can be no compromises. Jesus tells us that there can be no compromise. That's the point of Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 37. If you love mom and dad more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Because if you're not willing to be all in, then you're not worthy of me. He who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of me. Brethren, you can see the point that Jesus is making here. And I know of many people uh, who are in Christianity, who are in the Lord's church, who have suffered uh, division within their own families, and who have remained committed unto God, have remained committed unto their, uh, to their, uh, to their Lord and Savior Jesus, and they are to be commended for those things. Jesus brought peace to all who believe. He will reconcile you to God. You will no longer be an enemy of God. 
but you'll be welcomed unto God. Brethren, remember that there are things about paradoxes, and the thing about a paradox is they may seem contradictory, but upon further understanding, there's resolution. And so, brethren, as I get ready to close this lesson down, we need to understand that when we look at the resolution for the paradox, we have to understand the bigger picture. We can't just take any one verse and take it out of context. Yes, Jesus came to bring peace, but he also is going to bring judgment. Yes, Jesus came to bring peace, but there's also going to be division. And so we need to understand these things. Brethren, as I close this now, remember what the, what the sword, the word of God, does for us. While the sword, the word of God, may cause division, it also gives life. While the sword of God may cause division, it also regenerates. While the sword of God may cause division, it also can prevent sin. It can also cleanse us. It can also convict us of our sins. But as with all swords, brethren, the sword is only effective if you remove, if you remove the sword from its sheath and if you are willing to yield the, wield the sword. If you don't remove the sword from its sheath, if you don't wield the sword, the sword is going to be useless. And so we have to understand, brethren, that the sword of the Spirit, for it to be, for it to be effective in our lives as Christians, for us, for, for us to be able to use it to defeat the attacks of the evil one, then we must use it in a manner that is pleasing to God. We must use it exactly as God has intended uh, for us to use it. There could be no compromise when it comes to uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ. There could be no compromise with other denominations, all for the greater good of Christendom. Brethren, we have to make sure that when we study out the word of God, we come to the knowledge of the truth, and we teach it exactly as God has commanded. Not adding to, not taking away, but just allow the word to speak for itself. Brethren, it's the word of God which will bring us in unity with the Father. It's the word of God that has the ability to prick our hearts and save our souls. But we have to have biblical faith. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the very word of God. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He doesn't say, if you love me, you'll keep some of my commandments. He doesn't say, if you love me, try to take my commandments and kind of mesh them with uh, societal and cultural uh, trends. He says, no, you need to stand for the word of God. You need to stand for all that I teach. And you need to do so because the words I teach are not mine, but the fathers who sent me. So brethren, if you're hearing this message today, Understand that there's not contradiction in Scripture, but there are paradoxes in Scripture. And like I said, there's not contradiction, there's resolution once you see the big picture. If you're here today and you're hearing this message, brethren, and you are not a child of God, and that is your desire is to become a child of God, please come forward. You can come forward to, uh, to be baptized for the remission of your sins. You can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God will add you to the church. Come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation. Thank <laughs> you.